Okay. Um, so thank you for yeah joining me today um, for our second webinar on complementary medicine. So as I mentioned, my name is Jess. I'm Health Promotion Manager at Arthritis Queensland. Um, and today's webinar is about complementary medicine. So we'll be focusing on a few different types of complementary medicines and their effectiveness um, in helping to reduce some arthritis symptoms. Um, I think it will, we'll sort of touch on it multiple times throughout, but really a key takeaway um, whenever um, considering the use of, of complementary medicines in um, supporting your arthritis man uh, management is always to speak with your GP or pharmacist when starting um, anything new. But like I mentioned, we'll definitely um, go further through that. So first of all, just to, um, it's important to mention that this presentation contains general information and advice. So um, every effort has been made to ensure that the information is accurate and reliable. Um, and the content um, of this presentation is not a substitute for individual treatment um, and the advice of your doctor or health professional. So always consult your doctor or healthcare provider to obtain individual medical or treatment advice. And in the spirit of reconciliation, um, Arthritis Queen, Queensland and New South Wales acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So just a little overview of um, what we will go through in today's presentation. So we'll be touching a little bit on what complementary medicines are, um, their potential um, problems and how they're regulated in Australia. We'll touch on a few different specific complementary medicines, so including fish oils, glucosamine, chondroitin, um, turmeric and rose hip. Um, and we'll have a little bit of information around their effectiveness and safety um, based on um, a, an Arthritis Research UK report and some more um, recent, recent research as well. Um, and then some things to consider um, so that complementary medicines are used safely. Um, so first of all, complementary um, and alternative medicine. So um, sometimes the, the CAMS um, sort of little abbreviation is used. Um, so complementary medicines are a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems and practices um, along with products that are not generally considered part of conventional medicine. Uh, complementary medicines may also be called sometimes traditional or alternative medicines, you've probably heard them referred to as well. So this is in um, comparison to what's often called Western medicine, um, which is a system in which medical doctors and other healthcare professionals, so um, like your nurses, pharmacists, pharmacists and therapists, um, treat symptoms and diseases using drugs, radiation or surgery. Um, and this is also then referred to sometimes as conventional medicine or mainstream medicine. Um, as, as adding to that as well, some conventional medical care practitioners are also practitioners of complementary or alternative medicines or may use them um, as, as part of their, their normal recommendations and treatments. So, for example, um, recommending um, therapies like Tai Chi exercise for those with osteoarthritis. Um, just checking if there's anything else to mention here. So overall, um, although um, most complementary medicines are thought to be safe and, and some is evidence-based, um, generally the, the concern around the use of complementary medicines um, include that there is a lack of reliable information and issues regarding their regulation. Um, so often you, you may have sort of found if you have mentioned to your health team before, sometimes health professionals are a little um, reluctant or, or may feel ill-equipped to deal with questions like around complementary therapies um, and, and their use and their effectiveness. Um, and they may frequently be cautious about recommending um, 
complementary um, therapies. Um, and I guess that's sort of why um, complementary therapies sort of tend to, to sit within this group because they sort of don't have that um, thorough research um, behind them at this stage to support their, their widespread recommendation or, or use within Western medicine. Um, so like we sort of discussed, complementary medicines often sit outside um, mainstream um, treatment. So here we've sort of got the, the key um, sort of the, the mainstream treatments and, and the different categor categories on the left uh, with the, the complementary therapy sitting um, outside of that. Um, but more and more um, often people are starting to turn to alternative medicine um, and not as necessarily a replacement to those um, uh, Western medicine treatments, but often as sort of to, to go alongside those treatments as well. Um, overall, there is a, a wide variety of, of, of treatments available, um, and these can range from herbal supplements to practitioner-based therapies, and um, not all are supported or guided by scientific methods. So like I mentioned, we'll, we'll go through um, a few more of those um, in today's presentation, but um, there is so many different um, options that are available that we'd just never be able to, to fully touch on um, and, and go through in, in a presentation. And so it's always important to sort of, um, for specific advice, um, check back in with your healthcare team to really get that sort of updated information on, on the existing research and the suitability for you. Um, so complementary medicines encompass a broad range um, of therapies and they're often categorised in different ways. So one category which we've, we've not shown here is more around the mind and body therapies. So this can include things like um, meditation, yoga and tai chi and these topics were touched on in, in our last webinar. So if you weren't able to join in, in that one and are interested in finding out more, we do have the recordings available on the website that you can listen to. Um, we then have sort of these two other categories, so biologically based practices, um, so this can include dietary supplements, vitamins, minerals, herbs and spices, and then we've got whole medical systems, um, often re referred to as alternative medicine, so this can include things like traditional Chinese medicine, um, and naturopathic and homeopathic medicines. Um, so a lot of the um, information in this webinar um, has been drawn from an Arthritis Research UK uh, report, um, which was done around uh, a wide range of different complementary and alternative medicines um, and therapies used for arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions. And they went through evaluating um, the, the effectiveness and safety of um, various um, therapies. Um, and we've also got some more um, updated research um, that we've, we've based this presentation on as well. So we will go through, um, like I mentioned, some of those key therapies. So the report um, assesses effectiveness of um, various um, therapies. Um, and it's based on elements such as improvement in pain and function um, and increased movement and improved general well-being. So it ranges, um, uh, different therapies are given a score of between one to five, um, with one being the lowest and indicating there's no evidence or little evidence. Um, and five indicating um, several studies have shown complementary therapy is effective for um, managing various um, aspects of um, symptoms of arthritis. Um, but overall, just the, the main um, takeaway is, as we know, arthritis is an individual disease and what works well for one person may not necessarily work for someone else. Um, so as well as effectiveness, the report um, that we um, have used sort of to support this presentation also goes through um, the safety. So we've got um, effectiveness for arthritis is, is one aspect, but of course the other aspect is around the safety for their use. Um, so it uses a traffic light system, so red indicating serious side effects, um, amber indicating side effects um, that are serious and more common. Um, and a, a green traffic light indicates mainly minor side effects and for most people generally safe. So on to the, um, the first um, supplement that we're going to have a chat about today is fish oils. 
Um, so fish oils are oils found in the tissues of oily fish, such as sardines, salmon, and mackerel. Um, and they're rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so certain types of omega-3 fats can reduce inflammation from arthritis. And this may help to relieve joint pain and stiffness in a similar way to how some anti-inflammatory um, drugs and medications also work. So omega-3 fats are also found in other foods, so certain nuts, seeds, and oils. Um, and of course, including a range of these foods in our diet has many health benefits beyond arthritis as well. Um, but most people are unlikely to get enough omega-3 fats from their diet alone to reduce inflammation. So this is where fish oil supplements um, tend to come in. Um, it is important to not confuse fish oils with fish liver oils. So fish liver oils are those derived from pressing the cooked liver of shark um, or cod. Um, and fish liver oils also contain um, their rich sources of vitamin A and vitamin D. So um, the, the issue here is that large amounts of vitamin A can cause serious side effects, um, particularly, um, for example, during pregnancy. Um, so if you take fish liver oils in the doses recommended for arthritis, you may exceed the recommended daily intake of vitamin A. Um, so always only take the, the dose of fish liver oil recommended on the label. Um, and to increase your intake of omega-3 fats, um, you should do so with sort of regular fish oils rather than fish liver oils. So on omega-3 fats and arthritis. So um, omega-3 fats have not been studied in all forms of arthritis. Um, however, current research suggests that omega-3 fats are helpful for people with inflammatory arthritis. So this is um, specifically for rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, there is some limited evidence that fish oils may help with symptoms of osteoarthritis. Um, but it is, yeah, quite limited at this stage. Um, on, on fish oils as well, obviously it can um, have potential benefits for arthritis, but beyond that, um, fish oils also have a, a lot of benefits for our general health and for our heart health as well. Um, in terms of supplements, so omega-3 fish oil supplements are available as capsules or in liquid form. And different brands of capsules vary in the amount of omega-3 fats they contain. So it's worthwhile comparing brands um, and also speaking with your pharmacist for more information and, and help with determining um, the differences between brands and, and dosages. Um, your, your pharmacist as well as your doctor can provide more information about suitable dosages for you and your type of arthritis. Um, so fish oil and rheumatoid arthritis. So um, there is good evidence that fish oil can help reduce pain, um, morning stiffness, fatigue, swollen joints and use of painkillers. Um, the dosage generally used in um, the existing research um, is around 2.7 grams of omega-3 daily um, to help with managing those symptoms. Um, the, the evidence um, for, um, I guess, the benefits of, of fish oils and, and rheumatoid arthritis does differ depending on the type of fish oil. Um, and specifically with the, the fish liver oils that we mentioned, there's not enough research on fish liver oils for um, rheumatoid arthritis, but normal fish oils, there is some good consistent evidence for, um, for its use in rheumatoid arthritis. As we mentioned, the, the different brands vary in the amount of omega-3 fats. Um, and it also differs between the, the capsules and, and the oils. So um, as sort of shown on, on the slide, so a reminder to always sort of compare the different brands um, and speak with your, your pharmacist or your GP for recommendations around dosages um, for the, the, the brand that you may be going with. So fish oil and osteoarthritis. So there is some limited evidence that fish oils may help um, to manage symptoms of osteoarthritis. And this is actually in smaller dosages um, than that in, in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you may need to take fish oil supplements regularly at the recommended arthritis dose for two to three months before you notice improvements um, in your arthritis symptoms.
Um, so fish oil, um, I guess, uh, there's the safety for its use. So they're generally well tolerated um, and, and generally safe for many people. However, possible side effects can include um, sort of gastrointestinal effects. So um, a mildly upset stomach, um, heartburn, nausea, diarrhea. As we noted, um, there is the caution with fish liver oils um, and the side effects of vitamin A, which can include liver toxicity and hair loss. Um, it is also recommended that you consult with your doctor before having any major surgery or if you're commencing fish oils while taking medications like warfarin. So there is sort of some interaction um, that can cause increased risks of, of bleeding. Um, also just a note here on um, krill oils, um, which is, is another common one um, that people often may be suggested from, from friends and, and family to try krill oils to help with their arthritis. So krill oil is also a rich source of omega-3 um, and it is absorbed much better than standard fish oil products. So that can mean fewer capsules are needed. However, when we look at the research, specifically um, research on krill oil use and arthritis is limited. Um, so there isn't sort of much to say at this stage um, whether it is effective for arthritis. Um, and a lot of the research around um, omega-3s and arthritis has come from those fish oil studies. So the exact dosages that may be needed um, of krill oil um, is not quite clear at this stage. So moving on to um, glucosamine. So glucosamine is um, a component found naturally um, in the body um, and it's a, a building block of joints and tendons, ligaments, um, cartilage and synovial fluid. So glucosamine supplements are usually made from shells of crab, lobster or prawns. However, there are some plant-based forms available as well. Generally, it's um, previously been believed that glucosamine may help to stop or slow cartilage breakdown. However, the research um, up and, until now has always been very mixed. Um, and many of the studies have looked only at osteoarthritis in specific joints. Um, there was a, a recent research um, done a couple of years ago, um, which reviewed sort of the, the existing available evidence. And it really found um, that the, the existing research around glucosamine and arthritis um, was low quality and, and unreliable. So um, some studies have suggested that it may not be any more effective than placebos at managing arthritis symptoms um, or slowing um, the de degeneration um, often caused in arthritis. With that being said, um, glucosamine is generally considered safe for most people to try, but there are specific exemption, exceptions. So that includes, um, of course, people with shellfish allergy, people again taking blood thinning medications as there is some um, drug interactions which increase risk of bleeding. Um, also people who have diabetes, and this is because glucosamine is a type of sugar. Um, and those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, and really because there is limited studies that have been done um, around the safety of, of taking glucosamine during this time. So depending on your situation, your doctor might still suggest trying glucosamine, um, or if you're wanting to try it, um, definitely talk to your doctor or pharmacist about whether it's right and safe for you. Um, and for more information around specific dosages as well. And again, as we mentioned before, different brands contain different amounts of glucosamine. Um, so always read the, the label and compare the different brands and, and ask your pharmacist for some help as well around comparing the brands. So um, the next one we're going to touch on is, is chondroitin. Um, and this is a, another supplement that's usually um, often recommended alongside glucosamine. Um, it's found naturally in the body and is a, a vital part of joint cartilage. Um, so often a lot of the research, that there has been research that sort of looked at chondroitin um, by itself, as well as in conjunction with glucosamine. Um, so the, the claims around its effectiveness in, in research have either come from, yeah, its usage alone or, or in combination. 
Um, it's very similar to, to glucosamine. Newer research suggests um, that the, re the, the prior research behind many of these claims for its effectiveness um, tend to be low quality. So to date, there's no high quality evidence that these supplements are effective um, for any forms of arthritis. Um, however, as, as yeah, we sort of mentioned with um, glucosamine, it's generally considered safe. Um, and again, side effects are quite mild. Um, similar to glucosamine, there is a, the increased risk of bleeding, which is, is quite similar to a lot of the, um, the different um, therapies that we'll, we'll touch on in, in this presentation. Um, it also, um, for people with asthma, can make um, breathing problems worse. So if you fall into any of these groups, always um, make sure you seek medical advice before um, taking any of these supplements. I might just, uh, we've sort of gone through, I guess, a, a little bit of information. So what we might do is just sort of take a little pause. And if there are sort of any questions at, at this stage, if you, you do want to pop them in, um, if you, you don't have any questions um, to pop in the, the chat box, we can keep going on and, and then have a little bit of a, a chat and, and questions when we get to the end as well. No questions yet? All good to continue on? Yes, we will um, certainly send around the recording to everybody that's registered um, for today's presentation. Thank you. Um, so um, next to touch on um, is um, turmeric. Um, so turmeric is, a, I think, a, um, a, a spice that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, it's used commonly in cooking. Um, it has a warm, bitter taste and is frequently used to flavour um, or colour curry powders, mustards um, and cheeses. Um, and it's believed that turmeric and particularly um, a chemical that it contains called curcumin, um, that they have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, uh, Turmeric has been researched for its effects on osteoarthritis. However, findings are limited. Um, and at this stage, the, the certainty around effectiveness is, is not quite clear. Um, so like um, some of the other supplements that we have mentioned, turmeric and curcumin seem to be generally well tolerated. Um, and again, most common side effects observed um, in clinical studies that have occurred are around gastrointestinal effects. So again, constipation and diarrhea, um, reflux, nausea and vomiting. Um, and as we've sort of discussed with some of the others, caution is advised for those who take medications like warfarin. Um, and with turmeric as well, large doses potentially can also increase risk of kidney stone formation. Um, rosehip, um, an, another um, herb that um, is sometimes suggested or, or recommended for arthritis. So rosehip comes from a species of wild rose and is extracted from the fruit that develops after the flower of the plant has died. So um, where its interest for, for um, arthritis comes from, so it contains compounds that may help relieve joint inflammation, such as polyphenols and anthocyanins. Um, and along with this, it also contains vitamin C, which is an antioxidant. Um, but sort of for vitamin C specifically, it hasn't been confirmed if this will give any added benefits um, in arthritis, um, but there, there is potential that it, it may um, play some role. So rosehip again is in, available in, in different forms, um, generally as capsules and a powder. Um, so the um, effectiveness of um, rose hip specifically for osteoarthritis come from a few different um, sort of trials. So a randomized control trial, um, which is, is generally one of the, um, the, the best standards for um, research trials, um, show that people um, after 15 weeks of treatment, patients on rose hip had significantly um, reduced pain stiffness, disability, and consumption of painkillers, plus a significant improvement in overall disease severity compared to patients on a placebo. Also for rheumatoid arthritis, um, another study showed that people with rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis took rosehip 
powder daily for six months. And this resulted in improvements in disease activity, quality of life and physical function. So overall, um, there is some moderate evidence that um, rosehip may have some benefits in symptoms of osteoarthritis. Um, the evidence um, surrounding um, its, its use in rheumatoid arthritis is, is less clear, um, but there, there is some, some limited evidence that does show it, it may have some benefit. For specific dosages, um, so unfortunately the, the dosage for rosehip has not been well studied. Generally, um, the studies that have looked at rosehip have used an amount of five grams daily, um, but it is recommended to speak with your GP regarding the correct dose for you as well. Um, Rosehip is generally considered um, safe as, as well. Um, again, it can have mild gastrointestinal side effects um, and interactions with other medications haven't been well studied. Um, so again, where it's important to have a chat with your GP and, and depending on what other medications you may be taken um, and the advice of, of your GP um, is really important to take. Um, so this one I always find uh, quite difficult to um, pronounce. Um, so cap capsaicin. Um, so it is a component of chili peppers and it's extracted from um, plant tissues. Um, it affects by using what's called um, substance P, which plays a role in the transmission of pain signals from nerves to the brain. So it's been studied for its effects in osteoarthritis and in fibromyalgia. Um, and it generally um, is used in a form of a gel or a cream um, that's applied to either the affected, uh, affected joint in osteoarthritis or in, in fibromyalgia, the um, affected area. So re results have shown that in osteoarthritis, there is some evidence that it may help to reduce pain and tenderness in affected joints. Um, unfortunately, the research for its effects in fibromyalgia is still quite limited, um, so it's a little bit unclear at this stage um, on what um, or if it, it has any um, significant effects in fibromyalgia. Um, in terms of dosage, a lot of the, the trials have either used extremely small, so a 0.025% or 0.075% of cats in gel um, applied to the skin four times a day. Um, so the product is available um, often by prescription, but it can also be found in some over-the-counter gels or creams. Um, but again, it's, it's recommended as always to, to talk with your GP about suitability if you're thinking of trying it before getting started. Um, overall, it's, it's generally considered safe. Um, at this stage, there's been no reported um, drug interactions. Um, some people may experience a slight burning sensation um, and brief redness, um, which can be common when um, the, the gel is applied to the skin. Um, so that's sort of some of the more, I guess, the uh, specific ones that, that we'll, we'll go through and sort of um, the, the different research available. There is, of course, um, many other complementary treatments um, that you may have heard mentioned for arthritis. Um, I, we've mentioned just a couple here. Um, so cat's claw, devil's claw or ginger, uh, which are all extracted from certain plant roots. Um, overall, I guess the, the, the key takeaway here is that there are, um, and, and similar to a lot of different complementary therapies, there are small amounts of research that have been undertaken, um, which may sometimes show some benefits for um, different types of arthritis. But generally, um, the research that has been completed is in small amounts, um, and sometimes it's also inconclusive or, or inconsistent um, evidence for its effectiveness. So sometimes um, one study might show that there is some small benefits and then another study um, shows that it really doesn't make much difference when compared to placebo. Um, well, ginger, um, it, it tends to be generally well tolerated. 
Um, more research is definitely needed for cat's claw and devil's claw. Um, and there have been some serious side effects that have been reported in some studies. Um, so again, really important to speak with your healthcare team um, whenever starting anything new. So they can consider your situation and um, any of the health conditions or medications that you may take to know if it's safe for you to try. Um, so there can always be sort of various different treatments that although they may not show much benefit um, for arthritis, if they are generally safe and, and your health team consider them safe for you, sometimes it might be worth giving them a go and seeing if they do um, help and, and, and if they do have any benefit, that's really great. Um, but it's always making sure that um, you, you have checked and, and made sure that they are safe and suitable for you first. Um, so um, cat claw, um, as we've mentioned, cat claw and devil claw um, and, and ginger, they may also like some other conditions, um, increased risk of bleeding. Um, the other concern um, is there's not enough studies to suggest any of them are effective at reducing arthritis symptoms. And there is some um, research around their side effects and various safety precautions. Um, some other types of complementary um, treatments, which um, you, you may have tried previously. So um, various different sort of analgesic creams are available on the market. Um, and sometimes they are recommended to, to help with managing arthritis symptoms. Um, the main thing is they tend to be sort of short term. Um, it can be really helpful to, if, if they are effective, to provide some short term pain relief. Um, but of course it sort of does wear off over time as well. So we've got um, two um, examples mentioned here. There are many um, on the market available. So we've got Physiocrem and Voltaren. Um, just a couple of differences um, between them. So um, for Physiocrem, um, it contains natural ingredients that stop um, inflammation process quite quick. Um, so it, it tends to be quite popular among athletes um, because of its fast joint pain relief. Um, it can be used for muscle pain, but it is um, also um, suitable for joints. Um, and the smell of the of, um, physiochrome tends to um, have a, a better odor than Voltaren. Um, some people have suggested as well. So not quite strong of a smell. Um, as it... Um, works more quickly, um, it is more potent. So it can tend to cost more to buy. Um, also worth noting that it can be quite painful if applied to broken skin um, as it is a, a strong cream. So always um, read the label and, and use as directed. Um, Voltaren, um, it, it tends to be because it's maybe not quite as potent, it can be a little bit cheaper out of the two. Um, and it's also a very well known brand. Um, it, does need to be, um, it needs a firmer massage compared to Physiocrem because it is that, that little bit weaker. Um, and as we mentioned, it has a, a strong odor um, that some people tend to, to comment on as well. Um, and because it, again, it's not quite as potent, it can take a little longer to target um, pain in joints. Um, so I guess sort of a, a summarizing sort of some of the, the things that we have been th through. So um, some food for thought around complementary and alternative medicines. Um, so really um, the, the key concerns for doctors and, and members of your health team tend to be around um, the prescription and education of complementary medicines because of um, that there's a lack of reliable information um, and there's also issues around regulation of um, complementary therapies and their prescription. Um, so often health professionals may not feel quite confident to um, deal with questions from um, people around complementary medicines, their use and their effectiveness. Um, and they tend to be quite cautious about recommending or discussing complementary therapies because of worries about um, how effective they are, their regulation, and, and how safe they are. In terms of the, the lack of regulation, so there are certainly health professionals 
um, that are regulated. So for example, traditional Chinese medicine practitioners are regulated um, under um, the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency. Um, however, there are other um, health professionals that don't tend to have a professional um, regulation um, body or, or it may not be a requirement. Um, so there can be sort of differences around skills and, and knowledge and qualifications. Um, and th this tends to mean that I guess sort of there may be some um, therapists that are, are really excellent, but without sort of regulation, it's sort of, you may then sort of see a, another health professional, a, a, a complementary therapy professional, um, that it has the same sort of name, their health title is the same, but it's very different. Their, their standards can be quite different. Um, so it is recommended to always check the qualifications um, of any therapist that you do see and ensure that they are registered um, or have membership with a professional organisation. Um, another key problem with um, the use of complementary therapies is around the dose standardisation. So a lot of um, complementary therapies have not had, they, they don't have an established effective dose. And this is because the research that does exist for them can be quite limited. So um, there isn't sort of any consistent research um, that's been done on similar dosage amounts to be able to recommend um, this to patients. Um, and there tends to be variation amongst different brands um, on, doses, on doses that are recommended. So we sort of mentioned around how there's so many different brands um, of um, specific supplements um, and they do vary by brand and even by the form as well. So whether it comes as a, a tablet form or an oil or a powder. Um, so the other issue um, that we have with um, complementary therapies is um, they tend to include a variety of, of botanicals and, and nutritional products, so such as herbal and, and dietary supplements and vitamins. Um, so not all products have been approved by the Food and, and Drug Administration or the Therapeutic Goods Administration um, before they are sold to the public. Um, and you also don't need a prescription to buy them. So it's really up to you to ensure that what you are um, considering trialing, you have sort of really considered um, what's in it um, and what the benefits may be, as well as having a, a chat with your health team around the safety as well for you. Um, so the other um, issue that we've um, noted here is also around, um, sometimes it can delay effective mainstream therapy. So um, sometimes some people may rely on complementary or alternative medicines and as an alternative to conventional medicines. Um, and this can mean delaying um, the, the start of a, a medical treatment, or in some cases, they may stop taking a medical treatment um, to move towards complementary therapies as well. Um, but in general, complementary therapies um, can be effective if used alongside conventional um, treatments as well, hence the, the term complementary. Um, again, um, we've sort of touched on as well, is really around the, the long-term effects um, of complementary medicine. So um, we sort of mentioned there's limited research around, in general, the, the safety. Um, and this also goes for sort of long-term usage as well. So there's still a lot of research that does need to be done um, on various different supplements and, and therapies to really know what the long-term safety is of using them. Um, so if you are thinking of um, starting a, a new supplement or, or looking into um, a different therapy, um, I guess what, what can you do or, or what's important to consider? So um, it's really important to understand um, whether the benefits have been clearly proven so that you're not misled or given false hope. Um, so it's worth doing a little bit of um, research and, and reading um, and having a chat with your health team. And if you are sort of thinking of trying a, a therapy and you sort of um, know that it's maybe been researched a little bit and 
The effects are inconclusive, but it is generally safe. Like I mentioned, it, it might be something that you do give a go, but it's at least sort of going into that, um, knowing what to expect um, and that it's not sort of, I guess, putting false hope on, on the product, that it will um, sort of be a, a really effective cure or, or treatment and then being disappointed if it doesn't um, really provide any benefit as, as, um, at all. Um, so it's really important to openly discuss um, anything that you're considering trying with your GP um, or specialist or pharmacist um, before starting. So they may be able to provide you with more information around the evidence for their use um, and how effective they are. Um, but also the, the really key thing is around the safety and because um, there is so many different treatments available and everybody's situation is different. Um, having someone that is part of your medical team that knows your situation um, and can look at the research around the, the safety for different um, health conditions and different medications um, and provide you with that sort of specific individual advice is really important. Um, they'll also be able to help you with um, information around um, the dosage as well and, and for those specific variances in, in different brands. Um, you may, and it may be something that you have tried doing before and sort of found that your, um, maybe your doctor or, or a member of your health team sort of maybe seemed like they disapproved um, of, of trialing different therapies and it might make you reluctant to sort of want to discuss that with them. Um, but overall, it is really important to keep them informed. Um, because they can't provide you with the best um, professional advice if they're not aware of all the treatments that you're using. Um, so as we've seen throughout this presentation, there are sort of different medications that can have interactions um, with different um, supplements or, or treatments. Um, so it's really important that the members of your health team are aware of um, anything that you are taking, um, just in case there is any of those precautions. Um, I've also got a, a, a note here as well around um, just touching briefly on um, sort of nutrient um, deficiencies or, or vitamin and, and mineral deficiencies, which sometimes can be um, a reason why people might use supplementation. Um, and, and that is completely fine as well. Um, it is recommended um, it, and, and worth speaking with a, a dietitian if you are sort of deficient in a particular mineral or, or, or vitamin. So they can work with you to um, make sure that you're also getting the, those nutrients from your diet. So when we sort of look at um, supplementation versus um, getting things via food, um, of course, when we get vitamins and, and nutrients in foods, it's not just a, a single vitamin or, or nutrient that we get. There's so many sort of different components in, in those foods, which can affect the way our body absorbs them. So sometimes Sometimes um, there's certain ways we can get it in, in our diet, which can be really well absorbed and really well tolerated. But for some people, depending on, on their health status and, and different conditions, they may need supplementation for different vitamins and, and minerals and nutrients. Um, but it's worth having a, a check in with a dietitian who can provide that advice, advice around diet as well, as well as supplements that may be helpful in, in the dosages that you do need of those. Um, one thing I actually don't think I have, have mentioned as, as well is something that often um, people um, tend to gravitate towards complementary medicines um, for as well is because they um, can be natural and, and come from natural sources um, and people feel like it, it may be a, a healthier um, alternative or, or safer alternative because they are natural. Um, so it is worth mentioning that um, because they are natural products, it doesn't always mean that they are good for you. Um, and it's because with complementary therapies and, and we've sort of looked at how they've been specifically studied for different types of arthritis, they're often sort of extracted and used in more concentrated forms than what we would naturally get within our diet as well. Um, so we can sort of have um, too much sometimes, which can cause issues around safety and, and toxicity, um, and also how they interact with other medications or, or specific conditions. So it's important to remember that um, natural doesn't always mean um, that it is safe and suitable. Um, yeah. 
And then just finally, um, I guess everyone's experience of arthritis is, is different. Um, which can make it quite difficult when it comes to finding treatments that do help to give relief from pain and, and different arthritis symptoms. Um, so it does mean that while well, something might work well for, for someone, it doesn't necessarily mean it does work well for everybody. Um, like we've sort of discussed through this, it's worth sort of having a look at the research um, that has been done on, on different therapies. And sometimes that we do find um, they have had some benefit in some groups and it may be worth trying. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't always mean um, that for everyone it, it will have benefit and, and it will be helpful. Um, so just finally, um, some different um, sources of, of information. Um, it's always important, um, I think we, we all know, to be careful of what we do read on the internet or even hearing from, from family and friends. And while many people can be um, well-intentioned with making suggestions for different um, supplements and, and different things to try, um, unfortunately, they're, they're not always experts and um, so we do need to take caution with the advice that we do get um, from well-meaning friends and, and family and yeah, that we do read online. Um, some different sources, there is a medicines line for a number um, that you can get in touch with to have a chat. Um, if you are sort of looking for more information around different medicines and, and different supplements and therapies. Um, like we mentioned, always having a, um, a talk to members of your health team, particularly if there is someone in, in your health team that you feel um, is quite, um, does listen to your concerns and, and sort of um, considers the, the different things that you might suggest and, and ask them as well. And, and getting that advice from someone um, that is registered with a, a professional association. Um, and then just a, a couple of, of web links that we have included there as well. Um, so in terms of timing, we've gone pretty good. We've got about 10 minutes left, which is a, um, a really good amount of time for if anyone has some questions. So I just um, saw there was a question from earlier around rose hip. Um, does it come in tablets and powder? And what is the best form? Um, so it does come in, in different forms. Um, my understanding from having a, a little read around some of the research that has been done, there hasn't been a particular form um, recommended over another, and it's more around the dosage. So um, the amounts can differ between um, the tablets and the powder. So it's just making sure that um, we talk with a pharmacist and, and read the, the information on the label to make sure whichever dosage that we are taking is right for that form to make sure that there is enough in it for um, the, the benefits um, to, to work with, to, um, to sort of be in line with what the research has been done. Um, so yeah, not necessarily one better than the other. Was there any other questions at all that anyone wanted to pop in the chat? Can I ask, um, not in the chat at the moment, um, <laughs> I suffer from reflux and okay. medication for this. And look, it comes and goes. Um, I might be three months free of it. Um, but I also take turmeric for okay. my... Yeah. You mentioned that it, reflux can be, what, aggravated by that? Or what's the incidence? Yeah, oh, the, the incidence, I'm, I'm not sure of the, the top of my head. Um, I guess it's sort of in the research that has been done. Um, so the research will tend to sort of, obviously, they, they do want to know, what, particularly when they're looking around safety and, and side effects as well, they'll sort of look at the, the different types of um, symptoms that people commonly report, as well as maybe the less reported ones. So I'm not certain on, on the incidence. Um, but it is a, a more common side effect um, that has been reported in some of the studies around the, the reflux and some of those ga other gastrointestinal um, uh, symptoms as well. Um, it sounds like you're, you're already um, taking it and potentially it hasn't maybe had those symptoms um, in you. Um, but like mentioned, it, it is worth having a, if it is something that you are concerned about, have a, a chat with your GP and, and, and just mention it. Um, but they may be um, quite okay if it's sort of something that you already have been taking and haven't reported those symptoms as well. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, hi. I just have a, 
it may sound like a silly question, but the lady's talking about rose hip. I mean, yeah. rose hip tea is very cop, uh, popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there any benefit?